Hey guys, welcome back to another exciting episode of Is It Wrong? I'm the host, Ray Parra, with my co-host today, Metal Dave. Uh, please remember when our show to subscribe, hit the like button, join us on uh, Instagram, Spotify. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Greg Chason from Atomic Kings and also from the band Badlands. What's up, guys? People uh, you know, in the 80s, obviously, 90s musicians, whether you're a musician or whether you are um or or just like music uh you know there's there's you know the bands that you've been in um you know your the the bass sound that you uh, have you know right away um everything and, and just so the the audience knows here give you a little, little bit more deeper into an introduction um you've been in badlands you've been in red dragon cartel you're in mm -hmm. tommy kings and you span all the way into which is really cool for all of us because this is uh you know Big in, in Christian metal, uh, some of the biggest uh, Christian metal bands out there is the most iconic, especially with uh, the second Die Happy record, uh, Red Sea, and you even played with uh, Daryl Mansfield. So, no, I was just going to say, so there's just so many things that, like like Dave said, we want to talk to you about. You know, specifically right now, I want to get into a little bit of Badlands. We'll get into a lot of stuff, but I like with the whole Badland thing, you know, uh, we have a mutual friend who turned me on to you and said, hey, talk to him. You know, he was in Badlands, and then uh, you want to talk a little bit about Badlands when it first started out and how all that went about? Um, well, I had met Jake uh, when I auditioned for Ozzy. Um, I think it was around 84, maybe a little earlier, for the Ultimate Sin record. And um, I had seen Jake play before when he was in Rough Cut. And uh, I really liked the way he played. And uh, I actually, our mutual friend, Glenn, or as I call him, Glenda, um, <laughs> he was pointing Jake out and said, that's the best guitar player in LA, Jake Williams. And uh, so when I saw him play, I agreed with him. I thought he was a really amazing guitarist, great on stage, the whole nine yards. And so um, when I went to audition for Ozzy, uh, one of the reasons I was interested in going to audition for Ozzy was that uh, Jake was in the band. And uh, I thought, you know, if I get the Aussie gig, that would be a great gig. But if not, maybe at some point, you know, Jake and I would become friends, hopefully with me auditioning. And maybe someday when he was doing something else, he would uh, ask me to be involved in it. Well, I ended up being out there for about three weeks with Aussie. We were in Inverness, Scotland. So they flew me wow. out. There. And uh, I was one of seven bass players they were interesting in, interested in. They had done a kind of like a cattle call. Yeah, so they'd done a thing on MTV that they were looking for a bass player. So people were supposed to send in their tape and their picture and their bio. So um, I was convinced to do it by my friend Bobby Blotzer, who's a drummer and rat, and another guy, a photographer named Ross Halfen, who's a real famous photographer from that era, uh, did like all the stuff from uh, Metallica and for uh, Iron Maiden, Def Leppard, wow. that thing all the stuff for Greg. him he and i were really good friends so i sent in my package i did a real half-assed version of a package i sent him a photo and a bio and i sent him a basically me playing my bass into a ghetto blaster while another ghetto blaster was playing a song and then i played a different bass part to it and i sent it to them thinking nothing was going to happen from it i mean why would it you know they've, mm. they've gotten some like seven thousand packages 7,000 guys wanting to audition and out of the blue I get a call from Karen Osborne saying uh you know we <laughs> we'd love to have you come hello Greg this is Sharon we'd love to come <laughs> audition for Ozzy and I said screw you Blotzer and I hung up on her no more oh the drummer and rat being funny yeah. so she yeah. called me back and said no it really is sharon osborne and we, we'd love to have you come audition and i said a much stronger term you know f you blotzer this isn't funny she hung up on her again and then she called back a third time and she said uh, greg this really is sharon if you hang up again i'm not calling you back i went wow okay so they told me they wanted me to they had selected my package from the seven thousand people and they wanted me to audition. Well, I thought the audition was in L.A. So I said, well, where, when? They said, well, actually, we're going to fly you to England. And um, now, so backing up, I'm not a big fan of flying. 
and mm -hmm. I didn't think I was going to get the gig. And the rumor was that Jake wasn't in the band. And so I was thinking, okay, I'm not getting the gig anyway. I hate flying. And, you know, my one of my main reasons for going would be to try to get some kind of musical connection with Jake. And so I said, well, you know, I don't know. I don't really like London. I've been to London at that point. And she said, well, you're not going to be in London very long. We're going to get another plane right when you land. You're going to go up to Inverness, Scotland. I said, oh, and I said, well, who's the guitarist? And she said, well, Jake. I said, oh, Jake's still in the band? And uh, they said, yeah. I said, okay. I said, I'll go. Um, I'm away. I'll come and audition for Ozzy like I have any kind of power at all, which I have none. And I was really only known in L.A. and in Phoenix. And I said, I'll go. But you, someone's got to take me to Loch Ness, which is right by Inverness. And she said, OK, we'll have someone take you. So I made a deal. And here I am making a deal with one of the most powerful women in rock. And I don't have anything to back that up other than I can play. Right. And so I went to audition. Uh, they flew me to London. Sure enough, they had a guy there at the airport with a sign that said Greg Chase on on it. And that was kind of funny. And I flew to Scotland, hung out there for about three weeks. Uh, they were writing and re rehearsing and recording the demos uh, for The Ultimate Sin. So I never played anything off any previous Ozzy record. I didn't play anything off Bark at the Moon. We didn't play any Sabbath, which I knew mm. all the Sabbath stuff. Sure, and, sure. Uh, we just played the material that ended up on uh, The Ultimate Sin record. But Ozzy didn't really think I had the right look uh, for MTV. And uh, how could you say no to something? Right, look at that face. Hey, look at this. <laughs> if this isn't male model, I'm a male model, but I'm a hand model. Um, so I ended up, you know, and he was right. I don't have that look. I'm kind of always been kind of a, I don't know, rugged sort of construction worker look. And so uh, after three weeks, they flew me home. I didn't get the gig, but um, every night we, we would get together and rehearse before Ozzy showed up. It would be just me, Jake, and Randy Castillo, and Jake's way of rehearsing would just be to jam. He'd just pick a couple riffs, and we'd jam on that for 45 minutes to an hour till Ozzy showed up, and through that, um, Jake and I kind of realized we had a very common influence list of what I liked, what he liked, and plus my ability, uh, you know, I played in cover bands for 15 years, so I could, you know, just make up stuff right out of midair the same way he could. So we kind of bonded that way. I didn't get the gig, but um, through that, I ended up developing a friendship with him that has, I mean, you know, him and I have been friends since then. He's still, you know, my best friend. And mm -hmm. so... Uh, I kind of got what I wanted because then when he left Ozzy, he called me up and said, hey, I'm out of Ozzy. When I find a singer, uh, we'll, we'll audition bass players. Well, I had always took it to mean that when he left Ozzy, I was going to be his bass player because he already knew how I played. Well, he wanted me to audition. And I was like, man, uh, what if I don't get the gig? I'll look like an idiot. Everyone knew that we were friends mm -hmm. and uh, even Glenda. You know, calling me up saying, oh, Jake's out of Ozzy. You're going to be in Jake's new band. I'm like, oh, man, this could go, it's going to backfire bad. So I told Jake, I said, I'll audition, but I want to audition last. I'll be the last guy. And he agreed to that. And so I ended up auditioning three times, got the gig. And the genius behind Jake's idea for that was that um, he'd always told me he knew he wanted me to have the gig. We'd played together for 20 days or whatever and you know just did the whole jamming thing and we really kind of hit it off uh, we have a lot of other things in common too um and so i would say jake and i would have been friends whether we would have been musicians or not it's just right, like right. guys that you're friends with that you would have been a friend with whether there was a musical connection or not and that right. was kind of like jake and for me <clears throat> and so uh i got you know the genius of it was he didn't just give me the gig. He made me audition. That way it, it looked like, you know, I actually had to prove that I could be the best bass player for that band. Right. And, and it probably made all the other guys feel fair. 
Yeah. And Jake, you know, he said, I have other friends that play bass and they're going to want to audition too. And I said, mm-hmm. and they auditioned like 45 guys. And I said, wow. and some of the guys were in bands in LA that were, had record deals. And, but the whole idea of Jakey e. Lee's new band was such a huge thing that everybody wanted to be part of it. Uh, myself included, obviously. And so uh, when I finally got the gig, um, I felt vindicated that I did have to audition because then no one could say, ah, he's not even any good. He just got the gig because he's Jake's friend or whatever. Right. I mean, I'd have got the Aussie gig if I was cuter. (laughs) (laughs) I got something something to say about that Aussie deal. I I remember I I interviewed uh, Rudy Sarzo, and he was telling me a story where they did the same thing to Randy Rhodes. They flew him out of the country. He said he was going to go over there and they were going to do an audition over there. And he said when Randy got there, uh, the uh, airport police asked him what he was doing there. And he said he was going to go audition for Ozzy. And then um, they said, OK, that's cool. Do you have a work visa? And he said, no. He said, I, I don't have one. I didn't know I needed one. So they put him in a holding cell, left him there all night. And the next that day, yeah, well, listen, it is the next day they handcuffed him and flew him back to the States. He never even got to meet with Ozzy up there. <laughs> I've never heard that story, but that's a good one. Yeah, uh, yeah, Rudy had told me that. You know, uh, when I was there auditioning, Jake said, whatever you do, don't get really close to Ozzy physically because he gets mad at bass players, and if he's mad at him, at one, he'll headbutt you. <laughs> and oh, wow. apparently there's a couple bass players, and I, I had thought Rudy was one of them, but I could be wrong, that he broke their nose. Oh. And uh, I would have killed him so <laughs> i wouldn't have cared where we were at bozzy had a head butted me out of i'd have lost my temper and that's ugly ask glenda and yeah. so uh so um you know when i flew over there i'm from canada and i had lost my green card you couldn't do this now so mm. it was going to take x amount of weeks for me to get a green card um so i only had like a week before i was supposed to fly to London. So I went to the Canadian consulate and I talked them into giving me a passport without a green card. And I had showed them my mother's and father's green card. And then my sister and my brother's and mine was the next in line. And I said, see number three here, this is me and it's missing. I, my girlfriend's purse got stolen out of my car. This is true. My wallet was in it. It took my green card. I didn't pay much attention to it. I didn't think I needed it. So when I'm talking to Sharon Osborne and they're talking about flying me over, I said, well, look, I don't have a green card. And she said, oh, don't worry about that. We'll take care of all that. When you get the gig, you know, we'll we'll hook you up. We'll get you a green card. Well, um, I didn't get the gig. So they sent got me on a plane, gave me some money for being there, gave me like twenty five hundred bucks, which I didn't even know I was getting. And I basically I'm. At Heathrow Airport, I flew back down from Inverness to Heathrow. And by the way, they did take me to Inverness to look for the uh, Loch Ness Monster. And I missed it. I missed it by that much. Um, So uh, I'm going to fly back. I got to go through New York and get get off the plane. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do here when uh, I get to New York and I don't have a green card? So I came up with this story that... uh, and this is kind of true. I was buying some stuff for my girlfriend at the duty free shop. And if you've ever been to Heathrow airport, it's huge. And it's, mm-hmm. like, it's like a city. So I'm buying stuff and I got all my crap on the counter, my wallet and all my stuff and my English money. And I'm buying some things. And uh, they say, you know, United flight, blah, blah, blah is boarding at gate such and such. Well, gate such and such is about two miles away. So I get all my stuff in my bag and I'm, sprinting um they have a people mover and i'm running on it and i get to the i get to the plane and they've closed the door and the plane is backing up and so i explained to the uh flight whatever the ticket person i said look i got to be on that plane i said i got to get back to you know they said well you're gonna have to stay at a hotel tonight and get the next flight I said, I don't have enough money to stay at a hotel. I don't want to sleep here in the, you know, in the lobby of the airport waiting area to plan to get on the plane. So they yeah. actually called the plane back. They got the plane to come back 
I got on the plane, flew back, get to New York. I don't have a green card. They take me into the air and they say, where's your green card? And I said, well, what happened was I was buying some stuff for my girlfriend at the duty free shop and I had all my crap out of my pocket and they said my plane was boarding. So I put all my stuff back in my wallet, in my pocket. I must have left my green card there and they bought it. <laughs> Try that nowadays. Yeah, you just go right to jail. Yeah, man. They let me fly from New York to L.A., but I had to start the very next day. I had to go to immigration and apply for a green card. So for five days in a row, I'm going downtown to downtown L.A. where they have no parking. I'm going down every two hours to put money in the meter. And it took five days for them to give me a green card. I had to have a meeting. I had to have, go through all this rigmarole. So the mm -hmm. whole Aussie experience was it was really cool. And, you know, at the time, that was probably going to be the epitome of my career that, you know, I auditioned sure. for Ozzy. If I never made a record or never did anything else, at least I would have that. And uh, I ended up, you know, having a lot more adventures out of it than just that. Yeah. When you were um, auditioning uh, for Badlands, did Jake already have a record deal or are you guys still building and then shopping? No. He was, there was a lot of people interested, but they wanted to hear what kind of material he was going to come up with. And part of the problem was Jake wasn't going to write Aussie material. He was going to write something completely different. He wanted to do this real bluesy kind of like seventies blues rock on steroids thing, which fit me perfect. I mean, I started playing in 1971. I grew up with all the humble pine, deep purple and Zeppelin. Oh, yeah. and so that was all perfect for me. And so um, I initially, initially he wanted to find a singer. So there's a long story about how he ended up getting Ray to come out and audition for him. And when they auditioned, I wasn't in the band yet. When they auditioned Ray, he had Eric Singer. Ray had Eric Singer because they'd both been in Sabbath. So the three of them got together and played. And uh, Jake and I were going to go out the next day to BC Rich, which I had a sponsorship with, and they were interested in sponsoring him as well. So they sent a limo for us to drive way out, like, you know, an hour and a half uh, east to go meet with BC Rich. And um, Jake said, you want to hear the demo uh, or the tape that I made last night with this singer and this drummer? And I said, yeah, sure. So we popped it in the cassette deck in the limo. Cassette. And, it was just a bunch of riffs and Ray scatting and maybe, I don't know if there was some cover stuff on there. I don't remember, but uh, Ray sounded really good. I was like, wow, how come this guy isn't? Yeah. And he showed me a picture of him. I said, why isn't this guy famous already? Not knowing what Ray's history was. Yeah. And then I said, and by the way, this drummer kicks ass too. And he goes, yeah, he goes, that's what I was thinking too, because I think I'm going to offer him a gig too. So by the time I auditioned, they already it was those three guys and then 45 potential bass players um so you know it was i mean it was kind of a dream band because you know jake to me is uh is my favorite guitarist my best the best guitarist to me yeah. um uh ray best singer of his generation and yep. probably a lot of other generations yep. and i think eric singer was a great drummer i still think he's a great drummer eric gets kind of the bad a raw deal because he played in kiss and blah 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 but eric is a exceptional drummer writes great drum parts has perfect meter perfect feel so the fact that i got to be in that band was mm. like you know yeah dream come true i mean you're playing i'm playing with the best guitarist the best singer one of the best drummers um and me and i get yeah. to do whatever i want around the stuff that Jake wrote, which I always liked the way Jake wrote. I'm a writer as well, but I didn't even bother writing because Jake said, look, I have a whole backlog of material. I'm just going to try to get as much of this out, see what happens. If you want to contribute a, a suggestions or ideas, which I did, and he was totally mm -hmm. open to that Same with Eric did it or Ray. And, um, but I mean, I had no problem with the fact that I wasn't submitting, Hey, I got this song here. Uh, because I really liked and still do like the way that Jake wrote, the way that he presented, the way that he perceived music was very similar to how I perceived it. So, yeah, and you know, to me, when when I listen to Ray, to me, he sounded 
like a, a, a polished Coverdale. You know, he had the highs, he had the grit, but he just such a great voice, man. Such Ray, a great had voice. A, Ray had a certain quality that I've never heard anyone else have. Rake had a high note that he could hit, but underneath it, there was another tone that was a grittier tone, kind of like mm -hmm. Ray, Ray would call it a dual tone. Mm -hmm. And he would have both of those tones going on at the same time, coming out of one guy. I mean, when we would be on tour with other bands, they'd go, how does he do that? And yeah. I don't think that there's anything that Ray learned how to do. I just think that was his gift from God to be able to sing that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Glenn, Glenda, as you call him, <laughs> he's yeah. telling me a story about uh, coming to see you guys uh, at, at this little place in, uh, where was it, in Arizona, when he yeah. first met you. And I, I guess he said that Rob Halford was there and he would come up on stage and sing songs with you guys. Well, that was a band called Surgical Steel. Surgical and, Steel, right. Yeah, so Surgical Steel was probably the first metal band in Phoenix. And we were right at the same, when the new wave of British heavy metal came out, I was really into it. So, um, and I was the main writer in that band. And so mm -hmm. I started wanting to put a band together like that. So those were friends of mine. And one of them is Jeff Martin, who was a great drummer that I played in bands with, but he also could sing. Great vocalist. So well, we, yeah. had a, we had a drummer that we really liked, a guy named Bob Milan, one of the best drummers I ever played with. And so um, we talked Jeff into becoming our singer, but in um, Rob, we would become friends with Rob. Our guitarist, Jim, had become friends with Rob and Rob would come out and see us play. And then he'd come on, sing on stage and sing with us. And we'd do some priest. A funny story is he let us hear the uh, pre-release version of Screaming for Vengeance, the album. Oh yeah. And so we used to rent like ice, ice skating rinks or roller skating rinks or bingo halls to put on our own concerts. And they would draw, you know, anywhere from two to 5,000 people would show up at any gig. Wow. And part of that is because they knew Rob was going to be there or they knew the possibility that Rob was going to be there. And, and at the time in Phoenix, you didn't, you know, Alice Cooper was from, from here, but, you know, Rob was like very current at that time. You know, he's the metal god, so to speak. And yeah, yeah. everyone was hoping that every time we played, we would bring out Rob. So at this particular gig, Rob came to see us play and he was going to jam with us. Well, we had learned electric eye and screaming for vengeance. And you got another thing coming and he didn't know it. So when he came to the gig, we played those songs and priest had never played them live. So oh, we actually wow. played um, those three songs and, you know, at the time I'm looking at, over at Halford on the other side of the stage and he's got, he's just like, wow, <laughs> you guys are playing stuff that's not even out yet. And of course, no one had, you know, you couldn't record it on your phone back then because your phone was stuck to the wall of your house. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, he, he was like blown away by that. And we played, you got another thing coming. And the call and response thing that they, that priest did, we did that. So, oh, wow. So Halford was hearing us do that, and that was probably a plan of theirs already. You know, you got another thing coming, and then the audience. Well, we we did that, and uh, I remember him telling me that he called Tipton to tell him, "Hey, I just saw this band play these three songs, and they did. They played our stuff. The audience went nuts. Rob didn't come on stage and sing with us for those. Oh, he didn't. He watched us play them, and Jeff sang them. Oh, wow. and then Rob came out and played like you know." Uh, breaking the law and whatever, uh, heading out to the highway, whatever it is we did <laughs> by them. And I remember him telling me that he called Tipton to tell him, I just heard three of our songs and they went over huge. And they even played another, th another thing coming with the thing, you know, with the call and response. So it was kind of cool to get that uh, validation that way from someone like Rob. And at the time, this is before I moved to LA, um, 
that could have been the biggest part of my career that I played in a band that, you know, Alfred was friends with and uh, would come and sing with us. Now I knew a guy named Steve Brownlee um, who worked for a, a, a record distribu distributor called Green World. And he also knew a guy, uh, Brian Slagle, who uh, did Metal Blade Records. Mm -hmm. And we got offered to be on Metal Blade Records. We sent them a demo. And so they were interested in us, Surgical Steel, putting a song on. And they uh, flew over, or drove over, uh, Glenda and, uh, and Steve to see us play at, at some desert party. And Halford showed up and played. And they were like, because we were telling people, yeah, Halford, you know, Halford comes in, yeah. Rob, he's our friend. He comes and sings with us all the time. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, it's just Rob. You know, like, big deal. And uh, they were like, God, it really is Rob Halford. He's actually singing with you guys. So oh, people didn't really believe you. What's that? They didn't believe you prior to seeing it then, no. right? You know, the funny part is, uh, um, well, we end up getting a song on Metal Blade Records, a song called Rivet Head that me and the guitarist Jim Keeler wrote. But I put up my stuff. And um, that, you know, we got some traction from that. But the funny thing is the first time Rob ever played with us, um, uh, we put the rumor out that we were playing on like one day's notice and that we were going to have a special surprise and it might be someone from Judas Priest. Mm -hmm. So at this place that we played, which was in uh, Midtown Phoenix, which is an old warehouse outdoor area, we would dr regularly draw four or 500 people just when we played. Well, all of a sudden, like 2000 people show up it, the place was packed. So we play our regular set and then I introduce Rob and it was Jeff Martin's first gig singing with us in Surgical Steel. So it's his first gig, Halford's his idol. We're gonna play like five Judas Priest songs with Halford, who we had just met the night before. He'd come over to my house and watch the Cooney Holmes fight. And so we're set up to do this gig. And I introduce, hey, for all you people, uh, I like to enter, you know, Rob Halford, blah, blah, blah. So he comes out and plays. People are blown away after the gig. People are coming up to me going, that wasn't really him. That was an imposter. That wasn't really Rob Halford, <laughs> Phoenix, playing with you guys. That's the guy that you brought in. That's a Rob Halford impersonator. I said, yeah, he's really good, isn't he? You're an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> so no one really believed it until it happened a lot and then even in la um when i first moved there and people found out i had played in surgical steel they'd say mm -hmm. is that the band that bob halford sings with yeah i ended up getting kicked out of that band and when i moved to uh, la i didn't have anywhere to go but down here so i called up glenn and uh his friend brian jay who plays in keel and i said look i want to move to la Let's start a band. Mm -hmm. Let's get an apartment together. So the three of us got an apartment and um, tried to put a band together. We could never really put a singer. I was on fire to do something. I was in a hurry because Surgical Steel was back here and doing their thing. And I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to do something bigger than that. And so I was very impatient. So I ended up quitting after a few months. But I ended up, you know, helping Brian. I recommended Brian Jay for Keel. That's how he got in Keel. And Glenn and I always have been friends the whole time. I mean, been friends with Glenn since like 1982. Yeah, yeah. Hey, tell us, tell us that banana story <laughs> that we were talking about earlier. So I, I ended up getting in a band called Legs Diamond that made some records in the 70s, and they were still relevant somewhat in the 80s, making records. And you know, they still make records now and, and stuff. So I, I was real happy to be in the band. So. I w went to rehearsal and I would have to drive all the way to the valley. So I'm talking like an hour and 45 minutes in my piece of crap Volkswagen Dasher that barely made it one way, never mind two ways. And I come home and, and at the time I'm working at Green World and I don't have very much money. I'm getting like minimum wage. So I'm sustaining myself off of like a bowl of cereal with bananas in the morning and a can of tomato soup with, with, uh, uh, or a can of potato soup with corn in it. I made my own corn chowder. So I come wow. home from rehearsal. It's like 10 o'clock at night, and I'm in a relatively bad mood. And I look over, and Glenn, 
my box of cereal is sitting on the counter and he's eating a box of cereal. He's eating a bowl of cereal <coughs> with any had bananas in it. So I say to Glenn, is that my cereal? Well, yeah, it was my bananas. He said, yeah. So my guitar case was empty. My, my bass was in the room and the car, guitar case was sitting against leaning against the wall. And of course I let out a stream of swear words and I kicked <laughs> my guitar case and I kicked it so hard that I kicked a hole through my guitar case, through the back side of the guitar case, through the wall. Oh my and I'm like so pissed off and I'm kind of probably in my, uh, you know, manic state thinking of possibly killing Glenn. And so he's sitting there, he's got a mouthful of cereal and bananas and he just goes, and he lets the, it all just falls back in his, in the bowl. He's like, uh, sorry. He said that was your last banana too, wasn't it? I don't want it after you've been eating it. Don't eat my food. <laughs> and then, and then we still, I mean, it's a big joke. So now every time we talk, he'll say, uh, he'll make a comment about bananas and he'll say, uh, Hey, uh, you want to want to do this recording with me? Yeah. How many bananas do I get? Oh. Hey, you know what? Six bunches of bananas if you play on this. When I when I played with Die Happy, I go, "What's the pay? A thousand dollars worth of bananas." Okay, I'm in. <laughs> you know, he told me to tell you. He says, "Hey, tell Greg uh, that I got a bunch of bananas for him." <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm actually glad, Greg, that you segued into that because it's one of the big things. Is uh, that second Die Happy album? I mean, both were very good, but. Just such a huge sound, uh, bass playing, everything there. So, how did that start? How did you uh, end up being in Die Happy? Well, I had left Badland. Badlands had, was breaking up the whole situation with Ray and the no record deal, and Ray wasn't in the band. And um, at the time, I was thinking I was going to move back here to Arizona. So, you know, Jake and I had been talking about maybe doing another band, different name, getting a different singer and drummer. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm moving back to Arizona. I had my son was like a couple years old and I couldn't buy a house there, but I could buy one here. And so we were planning on moving back. My parents were alive then and my in-laws who still are alive. We wanted our son to be brought up around that. And I said, I'll still do the band with you. He goes, well, how's that going to work? I said, I'll fly out. And he wasn't that keen on that idea. He wanted, you know, the whole thing where we're there every day, blah, blah, blah. Uh, when Jake's in writing and rehearsing mode, it's it's every day. It's five days a week, you know, and I get it. And it was a hard yeah, yeah. for me to, to, to not do whatever the next thing, step was. So anyway, Glenn calls me and he says, uh, um, hey, uh, and I didn't know what he had been up to for a few years. He said, I'm doing this uh, band. I was, I'm in this band, Die Happy. It was a band called Vengeance Rising. And mm -hmm. it was a kind of real hardcore. And then we became kind of medley in doing this die happy record and we're going to do another record we don't have a bass player are you interested and i said well bring me uh, a record let me hear it. so he brought a disc and i said yeah okay so i go to this first rehearsal they don't have any songs written they have like a couple riffs i think the other guitarist i can't remember his name had a song that he had written an acoustic song about his brother called yeah, Doug. Yeah, and so that was the only complete song wow. so i said well what are you guys doing well if you want you can help us write some songs so that's how come on like a lot of those songs and i don't remember the names of them you know justified and yeah. that whole first side i i co-wrote that whole first side and a bunch of stuff on the second side they literally had just a few ideas larry farkas had a few ideas so larry and i started writing together Mm -hmm. And I'm really good at interpreting other people's <coughs> stuff that they're doing. Mm -hmm. so we started putting together that album. And because I was co-writing it, my influences were kind of coming to the forefront. My style of bass playing, of course, my tone, like you guys said, is completely different than anyone else's. Love it. Love That's my design. So I, uh, we went in the studio and they said, do you want to produce it? I said, uh, I'd never produced an album, but I'd been in the studio a million times. I said, yeah, sure. So we get in the studio and we start recording and, and I got along pretty good with uh, everybody, obviously Glenn. 
and Robin, I got along with Robin good, and I liked the way he sang. Kind of sounded a little bit like Ray at times. That's what I was thinking, yeah. And uh, I mean, Doug didn't even really play on the record, I think, except on maybe the song Blue. He just wasn't, he had some other stuff going on, so he wasn't really focused on recording in the studio. So I think Larry played just about everything, and mm -hmm. Doug might have played just some acoustic stuff. And so when the record's done, um, they all have a production credit produced by Die Happy. And I said, what happened to my production credit? Well, we decided that we all, would all like to say we produced it. Well, then you guys all should have produced it. Yeah. And all the time during the mixing process and the whole nine yards. It was a minor sore spot. I still liked everyone. Well, then, and they paid me to do it. And then they came to me and said, we're going to do this uh, live series. Yeah, the intense. And, uh, we're going to do that. We're going to do a couple songs off this record, a couple songs off the first record that I'm not on, and a couple cover songs. And we're going to write either a song or two. So um, do you want to do that? And I said, okay, uh, here's how much money it costs. They agreed to that. We went in the studio. I forget the guy that was the engineer there, but he was great. I really liked working with him. And um, Doug and I wrote a song. And uh, the, the ending point between Doug and I was when the album came out, he didn't give me a songwriting credit on it. And I think I forget what the name of the song is now. Uh, something Years or Restless Something or I don't know. And when, this, when the song, when the album came out and my name wasn't on it, the die happy live process and through the through doing that um and i was really kind of running the show in the studio there which the engineer producer guy he was really impressed by that and um at the end of a song that's on the die happy album i'm on robin wanted me to sing with him we were going to do like a call and response thing and i did and the guy at um for the label frontline matt duffy good friend of mine to this day heard that and said oh i didn't know you could sing and i said yeah and he said uh you want to do your own record and you can do whatever you want you got to sing on it and you can get whoever you want to play on it i went well, i never even considered that so i did i did a solo album for uh, frontliner for their blues subsidiary uh yep. graceland and uh we recorded as me, a friend of mine, Jim McMillan, who I, who's the first guitar player I ever played with back in like 71. And uh, I brought in Eric Singer to play drums. And um, we did it. And then all of a sudden it came time for me to sing. And I went, oh man, I'm gonna actually have to sing on this. <laughs> and that was the hard part, man. I was like, oh, I hate, uh, they, I'd sing and I'd hear my voice. Oh, I hate my voice. Oh, he, the guy'd say, uh, Tom, whatever his name was, he'd go, everyone hates their voice. No, you don't understand. I really hate mine. That's, yeah. not what, that's not what that sounds like in my head. In my head, I sound like somebody completely different than that. So that was the hardest part was doing the singing on it. But I mean, oh, yeah. it was a good record and I like it. And I said, I want to do a real kind of Southern rock, blues rock, Almond Brothers meets ZZ Top meets Johnny Winter. Are you down with that? And they said, absolutely. So they let me do mm -hmm. whatever I wanted which was cool. And it sold well. Go figure. Yeah. It, it was a great album. And then I think after that, is that where you went into the Red Sea? Red Sea. Uh, Robin and I still were friends and uh, he got a deal on Patriot Records. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so, uh, and uh, PK Mitchell was going to produce who I like. And I think he's an excellent producer. Good guy. And uh, Robin said, can you get Jeff Martin to do it? Well, Jeff still lived in the LA area at the time before he moved up to Tahoe. So everyone negotiated a price and um, Robin and I wrote some stuff. Robin had some material already and we wrote some stuff together. Um, and uh, I really liked the album. There's some good material. Robin mm -hmm. sings really good. Jeff and I play well on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, The guitar player, and I can't remember his name. Um, uh, did a good Chris, Chris Sorensen. Chris Sorensen, yeah. Yeah. So, funny part about that record, you want to hear the story? Yeah, absolutely. This is this is what my show is all about. Our show is about the just the backline stories. Just you know, we're just having a conversation. <laughs> the guy that 
that owned the label, a guy, I think his name was Mike Betts. Uh, I didn't like him and he didn't like me. He had, he had some stick up his butt about me and that just puts a chip on my shoulder. And so, um, I think, I think it was the amount of money that I was getting paid to do the record. And so, um, I, he, we had had a couple arguments and I said, listen, I'm not gonna, I'm going to show up at the studio with my gear and my tech, but not one piece of gear is coming out of the truck until you pay me this amount of money in cash. And he said, fine. So I show up for the studio, which wasn't far from my house in Torrance and Robin's there and Chris is there and they said, okay, I just bring your gear. And I said, got my money. And they said, well, no, but he's going to be here in a minute. I said, no, the deal was I don't take my gear off my truck until I get this amount of money. So he goes, well, don't you trust him? And I said, no, I don't. And so he says, he calls him up, puts me on the phone with him. Just, he goes, okay, fine. I'll bring the money down. Um, just get your gear off the truck. I said, no. I said, the deal was cash in hand before I unload. So he shows up about a half hour later, my gear's still on the truck. He says, okay, fine. He gets out his checkbook, starts writing me a check. I said, I'm not taking that. I said, our deal was for cash, this amount of money. He said, you are impossible to work with. I'm going to go get your damn cash, but I'm, you're never recording another thing on my label ever again. I said, no kidding. Wow. <laughs> so he goes and gets me the money. I get the money. I unload my gear. Well, they had four days set up for basic tracks for us to record bass and drums and scratch rhythm guitar. And Jeff and Martin and I did it in a day. And it saved them three days of recording time because the, the studio was blocked out. And I don't know what, what it was an hour, but it was not cheap. So we sure. saved them, I don't know, so four or $5,000, several thousand dollars, whatever it is, by, being, my, by Jeff and I knocking everything out in one or two takes. Yeah. So after the, we're done recording, he says, oh, man, you know, you're kind of a jerk, but man, you're an amazing bass player and you, you and Jeff just nailed that and you just saved me so much money. He goes, I'm definitely going to have you on some more projects with mine, of mine. I said, no, you're not. I'm not. <laughs> I said, this is it. End of the uh, line. Man. And that. You burn that, that bridge once, it's over, right? Hey, fool me once. Yeah. It, I just it, didn't think, you know, that it was going to be worth it. Now, I, I think he passed away and I don't like to speak ill of the dead uh, and I hope he got his life together. Uh, but yeah. to me, it's just a funny story. Yeah, yeah. Did you guys do much uh, touring with, uh, with that band? With Die Happy or Red Sea? Red Sea. No, and no, I never did one show with them. Um, what was it, Robin? I think Robin wanted to tour, and at the time, I didn't want to tour. I One of the reasons I left Badlands, or that one of the things about Badlands that was kind of happening was that I really was kind of burned out on going on tour and mm -hmm. I had my son at home. And yeah. so the pro I, when I left Badlands, I got other offers to join other bands mm -hmm. and I didn't want to tour. I want, I wanted to be home. My son was a year old. I missed the first yeah. 10 months of his life and I didn't want to miss that time uh, being on the road. My wife made good money. I didn't really have to tour. So yeah. I wanted a break. I wanted to be dad. So I didn't have a problem recording with people because I could come home every night. And even after I moved to, L, uh, to Phoenix, I would fly back and play on other people's records. That's what happened with Daryl Mansfield. That's how I ended up on his record. Awesome. But even after that, after a while, I got kind of sick of that. Um, I did a bunch of records for Mike Barney and I'd fly up to San Francisco and I'd be gone for a week and then I'd come home or I'd go do another record here or there. So I just really wanted to be off the grid so and just be a dad. And so I didn't tour with Red Sea, I know they did a, maybe a little bit of touring. I don't remember. And Die Happy did one miserable show uh, <laughs> in San Diego. And, what was so bad about it? Huh? What was so bad about it? They show up to pick me up, and they got a car. And, like, Doug's got his wife in the car. Glenn's in the car. Rob is in the car with his wife and – um Larry's in the car and I'm supposed to get in and we're going to drive down to San Diego in a car that's supposed to hold four people with seven people in it. 
And so right. I, wow. they pull up. I said, I'm not getting in there. I said, there's no way I'm getting in there. I'm not driving to San Diego for two hours in traffic, sitting there with, on someone's lap. <laughs> uh, take your wives home. So they yeah. took their wives home. And imagine they were real happy with me, but I didn't care. Sure. So we uh, go down. You, yeah. Go and on, on the way down there, Larry decides we're going to stop in Oceanside. And they're having Jack in the Box tacos, uh, four for a dollar. So he buys 12 of them. So he eats, he wolfs down these tacos. We get about uh, partway to San Diego. Oh, man, I feel sick. Yeah, really? That, that's yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> so we get there. We're doing the gig. He managed to snap out of it. We had been rehearsing, and Doug hadn't shown up for any of the rehearsals. So Doug doesn't know the songs because we're playing stuff off of the new record mm -hmm. and including some of the other stuff. And Doug's amp is on the same side as me. Oh, and he's so lost with what's going on that it's actually affecting me. I'm hearing, you know, Glenn and um, Larry playing the songs right. And I got Doug right next to me. So I walk over to Doug's amp and unplug it. I said, pretend oh, if you wow. want. I can't do this. And we did the show and I said, Dude, what is wrong with you? Rehearse. It's your band. How yeah. can you not know your own material? I said, I'm not doing any more shows with you guys. Plus, it was weird. I had never done uh, what, a Christian-based show before. Yeah. And, you know, the the rapportee with the audience was different than I had, anything I had ever really experienced. And it, it, yeah. I wasn't exactly sure. I, I mean, I, I was glad I was doing the Christian albums. My album has a... My solo album has a Christian bent to it, but it's not a preaching. It's not a preach yeah. album. It's kind of a sure. life experience album. And, you know, Robin was preaching the word and all that. And I was like, I don't know what I think about this. I mean, not that I don't agree with the word. I just, you know, you got to imagine I've been a musician all this time. And now I'm in a completely different realm. And how the whole thing comported itself, I was like, this is, I, I got to wrap my head around this. Well, the gig was so bad that they wrapped my head around it for me. I'm not doing any more of this because, I mean, I would have done it if the, a band was good, but mm -hmm. the band was so off center oh, that I was like, how do you go out and do a gig this way? Uh, I'm done. And that was kind of the, I think that was after I'd done the live Die Happy record. I just thought, you know what? I don't really want to be in a band. I'll just play on other people's records for a while. So I started doing records for Varney and then um, the, this guitar player that was, I did a record for Craig Erickson was doing Daryl Mansfield's record. Mm -hmm. And Daryl's a preacher, you know, he's, he's, mm -hmm. a, oh, yeah. he's, he's a man of God. And uh, I had, had heard of him when I lived in LA, you know, great harp player, great Paul Rogers, he sort of thing. And so, um, uh, Daryl called me up and said, you know, I'm familiar with your work. Would you do want to do this record with me? And I said, yeah. So I was, did Craig Erickson's record and then flew right down to, to uh, Pasadena. And we did Daryl's record. And that was a, and I brought in Brian Tishy to play drums. Um, they wanted yeah. a different drummer. And Tishy and I were friends and we always wanted to make together, still our friends, make a record together. And I said, uh, hey, Brian, you want to do this? Here, here's, he kind of knew a little bit about Daryl as well. And um, uh, we went down there. Daryl was doing some cover songs, some really cool ones like Spoonful. And uh, I suggested, funny part is we recorded and we had just done Spoonful. And I said to Daryl, I said, what we should do is Crossroads. And Daryl said, fine. So Tishy counts it off and we play crossroads just off the cuff off the cuff That's so awesome. that engineers got the tape on and we do one take wow. and the guy records it and no rehearsal no nothing you know me doing my best jack bruce tishy doing his ginger baker meets ian pace thing mm -hmm. Craig clapton meets who god knows who and you know uh Daryl was just spot on. And that's the song that's on the record. If you listen to that record, that version of Crossroads, it's the only version we ever did. Wow. The only time we ever played it. And it's, to me, one of the best versions of that song that I've ever yeah, heard. Yeah. 
I'm playing on it is irrelevant. It's just such a great off the cuff, you know, live statement. Now here's the best story of the whole thing here. So Daryl likes to do this one song or was at the time he does it on every record. And it's this long kind of epic sort of bluesy trudgy sort of thing. And I don't remember what it's called. And you're playing for like five minutes. And then at one point, like at five minutes and 31 and a half seconds, there's a turnaround, but you don't know where it's at. So we're playing this song, right? And um, me and Tish are in the same room and I keep missing this turnaround. I keep missing it and I'm getting madder and I'm getting madder. And, and I at times have had anger issues. <laughs> and uh, so severe ones ask glenn and so um we're playing it for the last time and we're playing it at a place called ocean way which used to be a ferrari dealership and so all the bays it's a big brick building and so you're playing it the room's a great drum room because it's brick and it's like oh yeah it's huge. Acoustics. yeah there's a stage set up and brian tishy's playing and his butt off and it's amazing and and i'm having a good time and we finally get to this song and i missed the part for like the sixth time so i had this esp tele bass that they had made for me um that i was using on the record and i got so mad i snapped and i spun around with the bass and i threw it And it went helicopter into the brick wall. Now, Tishy's sitting there. He's got his headphones on, and he's just kind of maybe taking a little nap while I fix this, <laughs> while I try to fix this part that we've been trying to fix for a half hour. So he's got the cans on. And this bass goes flying. It's still plugged in. And oh, it hits man. the wall, and the bass just explodes. The neck breaks off, and the pickups fly out, and it makes this loud. <laughs> well, that's goes in Tishy's headphones. And he's like, oh, yeah. what just happened? He's like looking at me and I'm like, uh, uh, I'm like looking for somebody to kill because I'm so mad that I can't fix this stupid part. So, so mature of me. Make sure you hire me for your next recording project. Yeah. And so I go in the studio and Daryl Mansfield and the producer are sitting there in the chair and I'm pretty pissed off. And uh, Daryl, to his credit, he looks at me calm as can be. He goes, got another bass? I said, yeah, I got another bass. He said, well, great, get us. Let's, let's go do this and fix it. And I nailed it on the next track. Wow. Awesome. And Tishy goes, dude, that was a complete buzzkill. What, what the hell are you doing right there? I said, I don't know. I just, I, I'm sorry. You know what happens is even with life, you overthink things. And then the simplest things become the hardest thing because you're overthinking it. I, I don't know if you know my history. Yeah, I'm a vocalist, sacred warrior, right? Yeah, we have a song that we've been doing for years, and the last two shows when we sang it, uh, the third verse I just like blah, 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 I couldn't get it. So we're in Germany just just a few weeks ago, and I noticed there's this girl in the audience, and she's singing every word to every one of our songs. <laughs> I get what so I told it. yeah. So the guys after the show, they're like, hey, uh, maybe you should ask that girl for the lyrics. <laughs> Because <laughs> I was overthinking it. I know the song during rehearsals. I sing it, but you overthink stuff, man. It's like I messed it up, so now I'm overthinking it, and just like, oh yeah. my goodness, man. Sometimes it's the best thing is to not think. It's like me not remembering the name of MTV. Duh. You yeah. Know, the funny part is, I I went snapping on on Daryl on that gig, and he came to me and Tishy and wanted to know if we wanted to go do a tour of Europe with him. Wow. And, uh, I had never, I've never been to Europe. I've been to England and Ireland, Scotland, Amsterdam, but never to, you know, all the rest of Europe. And I thought that was interesting. I said, well, you know, what's the accommodations? He goes, well, I have a lot of friends and we're just going to stay at their houses. And I went, yeah, I don't think so. That, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't sound like fun to me. I'd rather just have a hotel room. And, and yeah. they didn't have that in the budget. And uh, I uh, ended up not doing it. Years later, you know, I know Daryl has some issues now, and he's a great guy. And I ran mm -hmm. into him a few years ago at NAM, and he had a beard. And, you know, um, I went up to him. He was with his wife. And I said, Daryl, I said, I don't know if you remember me. 
I played bass on one of your albums. And he said, oh, which album? And I said, I think it's Daryl Mansfield and Friends. He goes, oh, yeah, the guy that throws the bass. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you and I go, oh man. He goes, what a thing to be remembered for. He goes, are you kidding me? I still tell that story. I said, yeah, so do I. Oh man. He was a hey. super nice guy, sweet guy. Uh, it was a real fun album to play on. He actually wanted to record it off my solo album. Oh wow. Uh, Love. And the record label wouldn't let him do it. And uh, oh, his label. Huh? His no, label wouldn't label, let him do it. Frontline oh, would wow. let him do it. I called up Frontline. No, because my record was just coming out, and for some reason they didn't want some uh, uh, confusion between because they were going to release that song as a single. That was going to be the first single out. It actually was the first single off of it, and oh, yeah. I think that was the concern to me. I didn't care. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. You know? But sure. Uh, it's the only album I ever did with Brian Tishy, but we're still friends to this day, and we always talk about working together at some point. And that's the only yeah. record I ever got to do with Daryl. And it's uh, mm -hmm. a high point of my career for sure. Yeah. I do want to go back to one thing for a minute here. Uh, and then Dave, you can, you can have it here, but something that Glenn had told me about uh, meeting Rob Halford uh, when you were with Steeler at that, at that gig in Arizona, he said, when he went to shake Rob's hand. Oh he said, yeah. Yeah, he goes, yeah Rob, Rob wouldn't let go of my hand. I'm like, why? And he goes, well, at the time, I didn't know all the guys knew, and they're laughing at me. And he said, "Rob looked at me and said, you ever think of, uh, uh, I forgot the karma, not karma, something that's meant to be, you know?'" And Glenn's like, <laughs> "What are you, what are you trying to say?" And he said that Rob was was trying to make a move on him. <laughs> I remember Glenn told me that later. You know, uh, they stayed. Um, I think they stayed at my friend's house, and we were all just sitting around after the gig. And he said, "Hey." And I didn't know Glenn that well then. He said, Rob tried to pick up on me. And I, and he goes, Did you? and I said, hey, well, yeah, take it as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, has he ever tried to pick up on you? I said, no, I'm too mean looking. <laughs> now, Rob's great. I mean, he's the first real rock star I ever met. And the thing about Rob that I like um, is that he never acts like a rock star. That's um, what I've heard. And he's just like, you know, you could just sit around and have a conversation like this over dinner. And uh, I worked for him for, a, 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 I don't know how many times, as a bodyguard for him. And oh, wow. he would go out and it just basically entailed making sure someone didn't, um, you know, get too close or harass him or, you know, just make sure people kept their distance, get their sure. autograph. But, uh, there was an instance where a guy got mad at Rob because of uh he rob gave him his autograph and the guy was sitting around pestering rob and and then rob said hey look i'm here with all my friends which he was there was probably 20 of us there and uh do you mind if you know i just get back to what i'm doing and the guy poured uh spilt rob's drink over on the table and it got on rob and then he oh, wow. it away so me and another guy uh that was just a guy in the party's brother went over to the table of these five guys that were like college age guys and um kind of said hey look you know that was like way out of line and you should you should you owe rob an apology and uh the one guy said well who the who the hell are you and then one of the other guys said i think these are rob's bodyguards and uh and the guy said is that true i said i really think you should oh, go give rob an apology so he did he got up, got another drink that whatever Rob was drinking and gave it to him and apologized. And he said, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't know why I did that. It's really stupid of me. I, 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 and as he walked back, he said, I appreciate you not, you know, which I, went, out of me. But I just thought the guy owed Rob an apology. So he was like, yeah, I appreciate you not, you know, getting physical with me. I said, yeah, you're, we're cool. We're cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I, I haven't talked to Rob in years. Um, I know he lives here in Phoenix, but I, I don't go out much, but, um, Rob was always great. He was always really nice to me, treated me like with respect, treated me like a peer as a musician. And, uh, when I got kicked out of surgical steel, um, he told me, I was telling him, yeah, they kicked me out of the damn band. He said, don't worry. 
He goes, you're way beyond what these guys do at this point. And because I was older and was had been playing a lot longer and writing a lot longer. And they, he said, you're going to go to L.A. and you're going to do something big there. And so when I got in Badlands, um, we ran into each other and, and he said to me, told you, he was yeah. he was he had heard Badlands. He liked the record. He liked Ray's voice, thought the record was cool. And he said, remember what I told you? And I said, yeah, he goes, see, and he was right. But at the time I couldn't see it, but he could. Yeah, yeah. And that happened on more than one occasion. I was in um, Surgical Steel and we opened for Uriah Heep and Bob Daisley was in the band. And uh, Bob and I kind of struck up a friendship and we're talking after Uriah Heep's show. And he was showing me this really old P bass that he has. And he said, what are you doing in this band? And I said, what? He goes, you're way beyond these guys. And, uh-huh. and now keep in mind, I didn't think that. But mm-hmm. he goes, you need to go to L.A. He goes, you should be doing something much bigger than this. Well, at the time, they were my friends. And, you know, when you're in a band that's like a local band and you're never really done it for real and you're thinking, yeah, we're going to make it big and we're going to we're going to get a record deal and we're going to be on tour. You don't know how any of that crap's going to happen. How's that yeah. supposed to happen? Little Phoenix in like 1980, 1981. So, you know, I, I was um, I thought that was really cool, Bob, to say and and. Uh, but I didn't really think much of it. And then um, when I eventually went to Phoenix, I uh, went to LA and I ran into Bob a couple times and I reminded him of the discussion and he remembered it. And uh, Bob's really, he's really sharp. And, uh, and, and he's same thing. See, he, he, I was playing with Jake and he goes, see, told you. And that, yeah, you, I thought yeah, that was, you cool. and Jake still good. Yeah. Still he's my big friend. We, we text, really? we text, Oh, multiple times a week about nothing important, just a movie I saw or a car he saw or a, a confrontation he was going to get in or a confrontation I was going to get in and, you know, just just nonsense. And um, I mean, at some point, um, I would uh, like to think that we're going to get in a band together again. Um, I don't know if that's going to ever happen or when it was. I was in Red Dragon Cartel. Mm-hmm. I was having a good time in Red Dragon Cartel. And then in 2015, I was diagnosed with cancer mm-hmm. about two weeks before we were supposed to go on a five-month Red Dragon Cartel tour mm-hmm. from from, uh, from like the end of April till the end of October, so however long that is. And when I was diagnosed, I had stage four cancer, and they were oh. giving me eight to 11 months to live then. Mm-hmm. And so I had to call Jake and say, hey, look, I can't, I can't do this. I, I have cancer um, and he was cool. I mean, he, he was bummed that we weren't going to do it because the plan was when I got in Red Dragon Cartel, we were going to be in Red Dragon Cartel or be in a band together till we got so old. And then I would tell him that we're going to get adjoining rocking chairs at the old folks home and we're just going <laughs> to play blues. And he said, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And so you guys would be entertaining the old folks forever, right? Yeah, we're just we're just in a rocking chair. We're both, hey, you know, hey. Hey, high wire. <laughs> I can't bend it. So the, the the funny part or the sad part, I guess, was he said, well, now how are we, you know, it kind of puts a kink in our plans. And I said, I, you know, I mean, he was cool. He understood that I was sick and, yeah. and that I was supportive. And, and uh, he said, well, I'm going to have to get another bass player. And I said, yeah. And uh, I said, I get it. It's not, don't, you know, I got to take care of this. So we got Anthony and they're really good friends. And Anthony's son is one of Jake's best friends, maybe his best friend. And, wow. you know, they, they worked, Jake, they did the Patina album and it's a good album. And, and Anthony did a really good job on it. And it's a, I think it's an excellent record. And uh, do I wish I played on it? Oh, I, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I wish Jake and I played together, but I mean, Anthony did such a good job. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't, I can't say I could do anything better. I would just do something different because my yeah. style is different than his. So Anthony I, and I are good friends and, and I'm not sure what the plan is for, there was a rumor that I was rejoining Red Dragon Cartel and that's untrue. It just kind of, something was on a, a heading somewhere that made it look that I like I had rejoined the band. I haven't, I have no intentions. Jake, I don't know what his intentions are. He's dealing with a 
carpal tunnel thing that he's waiting to get surgery on. And once that's done, you know, he'll be right back in it. I mean, Jake's a musician. He's probably been writing great songs all this time. And if he calls me at some point and says, hey, I'm starting a new band, want to do it? I'd probably be down for that. He knows that. And if he's doing Red Dragon Cartel, I'm sure he'll call Anthony and say, hey, you ready to go? And that's mm -hmm. fine with me, too. I mean, I, I have this other thing that I'm doing, the uh, Atomic Kings thing, and we put a record out uh, a little over a year ago. Yep. And in, uh, in January, I cut, I'd been in the band on and off for over 10 years, different iterations of it. And I got burned out. I said, I'm, I got to quit. I, I can't. I need to focus on something else. But Ryan, the guitarist, Ryan McKay, one of my best friends, great guitarist, works here at the store with me at uh, oh, wow. from Bizarre Guitar and Drum here in Phoenix. Um, I manage the store. Um, come and see me. Uh, 6,000 square foot guitar store. It's awesome. But Ryan works here with me. And so even though we weren't in a band together, we were still always writing songs. So I said, uh, we should record these songs. And we started talking about, you know, doing Atomic Kings. Atomic Kings has a great singer, Ken Ronk, great drummer, Jimmy Taft. I mean, I couldn't ask for anyone better, um, especially here in Phoenix. But to me, they're the top of the heap. And so we got together and talked about it last week. And we're going to have our first rehearsal uh, next Tuesday with oh, some nice. awesome. Ryan and I written. And we'll see where it goes. I mean, I like the guys. Um, and uh, I'm uh, I'm a type A personality, big time. So I'm probably harder to deal with than they're harder for me to, than, than you know me dealing with them. They're easy to deal with. I can be uh, ask Glenn a handful. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, you know, matter of fact, that's Ryan right there. My son. What's up, Ryan? Okay. So um, hopefully, you know, this works out. I think it probably will. Yep. But at this point, we're just going to take our time. Um, we had written some songs for a second record, and we're going to use some of them. But Ryan is a consistent, constant writer, as am I. And our everything works good together when we're writing. So, uh, uh, so, so Greg, uh, you know, you'd mentioned that a few minutes ago. So you're healthy now? You beat it? Yeah. Yeah. I went through the whole – I had 43 doses of radiation in my mouth. I had tongue cancer. Oh. Go figure that my big mouth would get me in trouble. As you can tell, I, I tend to, to rattle on a little bit. So I had 43 doses of radiation, 15 chemos, and uh, they removed all my lymph nodes from this side. I have about almost 1,000 stitches inside my neck here. Wow. And uh, that it'll be my nine-year anniversary this October 4th. Uh, and that never affected your speech or anything? Yeah, actually it did. I had to relearn to talk. Um, I had, I could talk, but my voice uh, register went down to like that. So when I got done, that's what I sounded like. So I had to train myself to get my voice back. I actually have a slightly higher speaking voice than I used to have. And it uh -huh. took, it took a couple years. Uh, and sometimes like even when I wake up in the morning, and I come out and I see my issues. My wife say, hey, what's hey, and I have to remind myself to put my voice back where it's supposed to be because no one wants this voice. So I sound like a guy that's been smoking nine packs of camels a day <laughs> for like 45 years. But if I don't think about it, this is what my voice sounds like. So I mm -hmm. learned and I do it now, on, you know, without thinking about it. So yeah. that's what. This is, to me now, this is what my voice sounds like. I have to make it sound the other way, which uh, mm. it, it took about two years. Yeah, we're, we're, we're glad you're past that now. And Thank you. Yeah, you've been the rearview mirror. I, I got a question for you. It's probably one you're so sick and tired of hearing about. Oh, I don't care. Will they ever release, re-release those uh, original Badland albums? Well, there's all this nonsense about what's going on that I won't get into all that because yeah. it's not funny, but what it really is is the record company not wanting to release that stuff because if it ever got re-released, we would possibly recoup our advance, which means the masters of those records would go back to Jake 
and me and raise the state and um we could do whatever we wanted with them um yeah. that they we <laughs> us and the record company didn't get along good our manager that we had at the time was part of we were signed to atlantic to a side label called titanic that was supposedly our titanium it should have been mm -hmm. titanic titanium that was <laughs> supposedly put together just for us so when we had problems with our manager who uh, we didn't like it all. We didn't trust him. And again, he's passed on. I hate to speak ill of the dead, but yeah. he was not, as far as we were concerned, a good manager or a good person. And mm -hmm. there's a number of things and I won't get into it, but um, we fired him. Well, when you fire one fourth of your record label, things aren't going to go good. So yeah, right. as soon as we fired him, our first album went in the cutout bin. So our yeah. first album was still selling. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden stores couldn't reorder it. So we're sitting there like 481,000 records sold, still selling records, getting ready to do a second record and go on tour, which would have still pulled the first record with it. They, you could no longer reorder it. So we would never get a gold record out of that. We, and when a record's a cutout, even when it's sold, it doesn't go against your sales figures. Yeah. Mm. Well, we had a two album deal. They had to do the second record, but uh there was some other drama that went on between us and the record label as well they got pretty mad about some stuff that was said in an interview um and they pulled our tour support mm. we went on the road as our with we paid for it ourselves we um me and we had a road manager and a sound man slash same guy and me advancing a tour i never advanced a tour before but i helped him do it and we basically financed our own tour well atlantic was so pissed off at us they told anyone that worked in new york in their offices not to promote voodoo highway and so um or they would be fired and i wow. personally two people uh, a girl and a guy that were both fired because they got caught they were big fans of the band promoting voodoo highway mm. and uh the rest is history so they they released the record like they were required to um they paid for a video like they were required to mm -hmm. but they did very little promotion we still sold i don't know 300 i don't know between three and four hundred thousand copies of it maybe slightly over four but mm -hmm. you could never reorder it any more than the first one so we left atlantic and there's always been a big schism between uh, them and us and uh i think that the stories that you hear about ray are stories that are made up by a wreck of vindictive record company mm -hmm. and, uh, to keep from uh really uh, from us ever getting control of the masters of our record that's my sure. opinion it's yeah. only my opinion i know jake shares some of that and if you ever do an interview with jakey he's he'll give you his side of whatever he feels like saying but mm -hmm. in, in my opinion it's just if you piss off someone i mean atlantic doesn't need us they don't need right here's we're going to sell and yeah. i'll tell you uh, 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 the second record voodoo highway went gold in japan so when you get a gold record the record company has to pay for that record for that absolutely with you and um, I have a gold record from the first album in Japan and uh, there was one guy that from the record company of the four guys that I was good friends with and he said hey Voodoo Highway went gold in Japan but uh, Atlantic's not going to pay for the record you're never going to get a gold record out of it so um, mm -hmm. you know and I, I don't do anything for gold records I don't really care I mean yeah. it'd be, it'd be cool whatever but the fact that uh, they that tells you the the length of what that what they're willing to do to not even you know give us our gold record so right, right. Um, if, if the first album got re-released we'd go gold in about two weeks sure. I'm pretty sure you could sell twenty thousand hard copies Absolutely. of the first badlands album in a couple weeks because i get the question you ask me i get all the time that's so why again, yep yep my my opinion that's what i think and that's what i've heard from uh, mm -hmm. one of the guys from the record that was on the label that this was going to be, you're never going to see that. As a matter of fact, this, the record came out in England and uh, somehow 
in England, a label there, and I can't remember the name of it, got a hold of the Masters and put it out, and Atlantic shut them down. Wow. Really? Mm -hmm. That's why that the album, uh, I forget the name of the label, maybe it was Rock Candy. Um, they put the record out, Atlantic put a cease and desist on them and said, no way. And uh, it's all under this phony baloney lawsuit crap that doesn't exist, by the way. Just so mm -hmm. we, I'm going to just kind of skirt the issue here. I've had two lawyers and two managers, and Jake has had at least that much look into this and we can right. find no evidence whatsoever of this lawsuit it doesn't exist yeah and yeah you couldn't keep you're not allowed to not pay jake and me my royalties under the guise of this phony baloney lawsuit so the whole thing is just a bunch of wind just to keep jake from ever having control of his own records yeah it's the old uh scare tactics i said it i won't back down from it that's what i said and that's yeah, my yeah. Well, it's yeah. it was amazing music. Um, we, we definitely don't want to hold you up. We see you guys are leaving there and <laughs> the last guy there. So we've really appreciated your time and uh, it's been a fantastic interview. Great. Again, just like conversation. Great talking to you. And uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, well, man. And thanks. We don't have a cauliflower ear from listening to me yak on for an hour, but uh, no, we no not at all, man. We, we appreciate it. You know, uh, Dave and I had a discussion earlier. There were so many things that were just unanswered. And I said, you know what? He's get, Glenn's going to have the answers for all these questions. Because you hear rumors. You hear stuff all over the place, right? And you really never know until you're speaking to the man. When you hear it you know, right from your mouth. You know what I'm saying? Right. And all the rumors. and stuff. So I think it's been great. Part of why we do this, again, I said we, we like to get the backstories, the stuff that normal people aren't going to know. You're going to know the real story, and that's what we do this for, you know, just to give people information. And, man, it's been great. You, you've been a great guy. I would love to have you on again in the future if you do something more with Atomic Kings or you do something, you know, whatever, you know. You make it easy on us because you like to talk, and that's what we're all about. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the, the platform, and I appreciate the time. And when the Kings get up and running, I'll do an interview with maybe me and Ryan. Ryan and I, when I was in the band, we're doing a lot of interviews together and our sense of humor is pretty out there. So it works. Pretty yeah, good. Good. <laughs> good. Good. So listen, hang in for a minute. We're going to, we're going to close this off, but hang in for a second. Don't hang up. And the guys, again, uh, thank you so much. This was Greg chase on we had on today. And remember guys, this is for you. Remember to subscribe and like join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Facebook. I said Facebook twice, didn't I? What a loser. Yeah. <laughs> at least you anyway, remember. So, at least you yeah, remember. Facebook. I'm still yeah. can't believe it. Got an MTV. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Until then, y'all, is it wrong? Hang in there for a second, all right?